name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. O God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord.
from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <coughs> Amen. Text for our consideration is taken from the Gospel of St. John, the one appointed for the fifth Sunday of Easter. In the name of Jesus, who is the true vine, dear branches on that vine. In 1821, it took the better part of a year to travel across the country. In 1921, it took the better part of a week to do the same. And in 2021, it takes just a little bit longer than six hours to fly from New York City to Los Angeles. In 1821, chances are if you were communicating with anyone, you were sending letters. In 1921, you might have been selling, sending telegrams or telegraphs. But in 2021, chances are you're just shooting video. A hundred years ago, it was inconceivable to be able to talk to people across long distances. 50 years ago, we still had party lines. Remember those? 20 years ago, you were still more likely to, to call someone than to write someone. 10 years ago, you might have posted something on your wall, but again, today, we simply shoot video and send it anywhere in the world that we want. In other words, by every conceivable measure, whether it be communication or, or travel or availability of, of resources or availability of, of information, by every conceivable measure, we live in the most connected time in human history. And yet, study after study after study suggests that we also live in the loneliest and most isolated time in human history. History. And that, that, even more so among those generations, millennials and Generation Z, the, the youngest of the young, that among those individuals who are most comfortable, most adept, most in the know when it comes to living asynchronous, that is, not governed by a set time. If you ever watch TV anymore, you do so whenever you want click of a button, and illocal, that is, without needing to be in a fixed or, or set place, in other words, if you want to watch that same show, you don't have to be on the couch at 8 o'clock, you can be in your car, driving to Chicago. Those generations who are most comfortable living in an asynchronous, illocal kind of life, with all sorts of, of, of availability of information and, and connectedness, they're the ones who feel it worst. At the most connected moment in human history, study after study after study says that we are also the most lonely and isolated we have ever been. And so, it might occur to you that if the advances of science, the wonders of technology can't make us feel any more connected than they do or than we are, then what chance at all, what hope at all, does a couple millennia old teaching about a guy that no one living on this earth has ever laid eyes on could possibly have? In other words, <laughs> who needs Jesus? But it turns out, for those longing for community, 
Jesus knows more about connectedness than the world has ever known. And so he, in the Gospel of St. John, describes exactly what it's like to be connected in the vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. I am the vine, you are the branches. And talk, talk about connected. Can, can it get any more connected than that? Can it get any closer than that relationship of a vine to its branches? That, that kind of relationship doesn't even, doesn't even exist among a parent and their offspring. Eventually, a child grows up and leaves the house and has their own job and buys their own food and, and lives in their own place, at least you hope so. But for a vine and branches, life only exists, life only happens so long as the branch is attached to that vine. It, can it get any closer? Can it, can it get any more connected? For the branches, there is no such thing as life. There is no such thing as food. There is no such thing as existence, as meaning, as purpose. There is no such thing as any of it apart from the vine. It simply cannot happen. For a branch that has been disconnected from the vine, there's only one outcome. The outcome is, is death. It withers up, as Jesus says later, and, and is thrown into the fire. Because what else do you do with withered branches? Can there be any closer connection than the one which Jesus describes? And he's not done in speaking about close connections by simply talking about vine and branches or his relationship to us and, and our relationship to him. But he's got an, he has an exceedingly close relationship also with his father. A fascinating relationship with his father as vine to gardener. Now, no gardener worth anything at all would ever do anything to jeopardize the vine. Every gardener, any gardener who's, who's worth any gardening ability at all does exactly what is needed and necessary for that vine. And so also the Father. Though Jesus needs nothing because he is God, as he comes into humanity to serve humanity, as he becomes that appointed and promised anointed one, Father in heaven by his plan and will does exactly what is needed and necessary so that the vine might give life to the branches. Can there be any closer relationship than vine to branches and vine to gardener? So that everything which the gardener does ultimately benefits also the branches. Turns out Jesus knows more about connectedness, more about what is essential than the world has ever known. Turns out what the world needs is more community, not more content. Now don't misunderstand that. This isn't a, a screed about the pitfalls and, and problems of technology, and it's certainly not a uh, hearkening back to the good old days, wh whatever those are. But we have to be crystal clear about what life is and what life isn't if we're going to find any kind of life at all, if that life is going to have purpose, is going to have meaning. And so when God created life, he, he did so in, in a context that is entirely, entirely dependent. As wonderful as individualism is and as wonderful as independence is, no one ought to think that they exist unto themselves. No one ought to think that life is about those things or, or that they, they can do it all on their own, like there's some kind of an island. That's not how God created life to be. He created life to be lived in community. Dependent on him, but also dependent on one another. And when we talk about community, we talk about what is held in common. Right? 
And that's what community means, a commonality, a common unity. So when we talk about community, we talk about those things that, that we share as, as dif- disparate and different, maybe even as opposed as we might be to one another. There's something there, something shared, some bond, some binding agent that, that makes us have something in common. It, it could be anything. It could be values. It could be geography. It could be ideals. It could be ethics. It could be It could be something as insignificant as the fact that on Sundays in fall, you and I wear green t-shirts with G's on them. Whatever the the binding agent might be, that is what is held or shared in common. It's what what creates community. So it just so happens that when it comes to community, time and place and physical presence are, are paramount are tantamount to establishing community. Jesus said, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and, and burned. For those longing for connectedness, Jesus has what you say might be the recipe. And it turns out that that, that the things that we share, the things that we hold in common, they they have a certain bearing in time and in place and in in physical presence and presence. That's why even though we live in the most connected time in the history of the world, people feel so disconnected because we live now asynchronously, apart, detached from bearings of time. We live illocally without needing to be in fixed places for fixed events. And increasingly, increasingly, we live as though we can detach our physical from our spiritual. But such is not the case. Jesus says that time and place and physical presence are critical, are tantamount to community. He does it with the analogy of of branches and vines again. Notice, physical presence. A branch that is not physically present in the vine cannot have any kind of life, purpose, or meaning. It's impossible. Time is important. Jesus says, if you keep on remaining in me, in other words, it has to be an ongoing thing. It has to be a never-present thing. It can't be a hit and miss, a once in a while thing. It has to be ongoing and continual. Time matters. And location matters, right? In the vine. Not kind of sort of by the vine, but in the vine. And so if, if we want to have community, well, then it would seem that Jesus is the expert. First, because he knows of a, a, connecting, a connectedness that is more intimate and more unfathomable than anyone we've known. He knows of the principles behind community, which are essential to building it. Yeah. So for those longing for community, there is great news because in Jesus, in the family, in the fold, in the flock, in the In the vine, there is great community to be had. First and foremost, a community with God. I am the vine, Jesus says. My father is the gardener. And so for the branches, that's a tremendously important community to have. A oneness, a shared bond with With God, who wouldn't want that, especially those who know that by themselves all we are are dried up, no good, withered branches anyhow. So that we understand and come to know what Jesus speaks in his word, right? He says that too. He says that you are clean through my word. It's a really interesting play on words Jesus gives when he says that the gardener's job is to prune And then by means of that pruning, you become, well, pruned or clean, as is translated in our text. You already 
are pruned. You already are clean. All of that stuff that would defile you, that would degrade you, that would, that would destroy you, all of that stuff, the Father has already lovingly shaved off. He's done it by grafting you into the vine through a, a, a shared experience with the rest of the saints on earth. He, he grafts you into the vine by way of water. It's a different kind of grafting than we've ever known. But he does it through baptism. As he, he calls us into the family and grafts us into the vine so that we have life through the vine and can bear fruit in our lives. If we want to know community then, if we want to know connectedness then, then we have to, we must know Jesus. And knowing Jesus, knowing the forgiveness that he brings, knowing the life that his resurrection promises, well, then we have the most important and most cherished community we could ever have, a oneness, a shared commonality with God. But it doesn't stop there. Connected into the vine as we are, we, we become one with other branches. That's what vines do, right? And so if we want to have community, if we, if we long for community, if we, want it to be, if we want to be connected to others, well, then it seems that Jesus is the proper place for that, too. Because connected to Jesus as we are, he transforms life from being a, a nonsense, unknown thing into a, a thing with meaning and with purpose. He says, if you remain in me, as long as you remain in me, however you remain in me, you're going to bear fruit. Right? Jesus, Jesus establishes community not just with God, but with one another by giving life purpose and meaning. Apart from Jesus, every day is just a bizarre undertaking, a ridiculous undertaking in some ways. What does it all mean? Why are we doing anything that we do? But in Jesus, now, now life has sense. Now life has purpose. Now life has meaning. It's to bear fruit. See, what the gardener wants to do is he wants to bless others by what he accomplishes through us. You ever think about that? That, that really there is, there is no value whatsoever for the, the vine nor the branches in the bearing of the fruit. And it's not for its nourishment that the fruit is made. It's not for... It's health that the fruit is made. In fact, it takes loads and loads of energy and lots and lots of time, boatloads of resources in order for a vine and branches to bear fruit. But notice what fruit does. It feeds others. It blesses others. It propagates more branches by the seeds contained therein. And so, in calling us to a life of meaning and of purpose by calling us into a life that is a life that bears fruit. Whether we know it's happening or not, Jesus gives to us purpose and meaning and he gives to others blessing and good. And so we attack, enjoy, dwell in, whatever the verb might be that, that suits the day, we cherish the vocations, the callings which God gives to us, by which he tries then to bless still others, to establish and grow community, that shared experience. And so as a father, we do fatherly things, or as a mother, we do motherly things, or as an employee, we do employee things. All things by which God intends to bless others, so that they come to know a more intimate connectedness in this otherwise chaotic and absurd world. Turns out Jesus knows a little bit about connectedness and a little bit about community. Not only, not only does this connectedness to Jesus, though, assure us of life and of purpose and of meaning, but notice what else it does. It serves to explain those shared experiences that, that aren't necessarily good and enjoyable. Hearkening back to the beginning of our text, Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. And he prunes away every branch that is dead, and he prunes away everything that is not going to benefit you. 
See, connected to Jesus, we, we, we gain an understanding of why lousy things happen in a lousy world. It's God who is doing them. They aren't happening just at random. They are outside of his control, but instead, like the expert gardener that he is, he uses these things to trim and refine and remove anything that might destroy, anything that might separate us from the vine, which is the source and cause of life. Like an expert gardener who knows exactly what he is doing and exactly when he does it, so is our Heavenly Father, causing and allowing certain circumstances to come into our life at precisely the right moment for precisely the right purpose to keep us ever grafted into Jesus, ever close to Jesus, and ever close and valuable to one another. Turns out Jesus knows a little something about being connected. So, branches. Branch out. Right? The, 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 the opportunity that Jesus sets before us today is an opportunity unlike one the world has ever known before. We live in the most connected time in human history, and people are feeling the most unconnected they have ever felt. You have the answer, you have the solution. His name is Jesus, He is the vine. You are the branches. You will bear fruit. That's his promise. So branches, go ahead and branch out. Amen. God of all grace, we thank you for the gift of eternal life in your Son. By the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and by the faithful testimony of the apostles, you have assured us that our faith stands on a sure and solid foundation. Though we do not see Jesus with our physical eyes, help us see him with the eyes of faith. Through your Holy Spirit, breathe on your church that it may faithfully proclaim the gospel of our risen Savior with courage and diligence in all lands and to all people. Grant that we also may be illumined by the heavenly light of your word, and so keep us in the one and only true faith. Preserve us from all assaults on our souls. Deliver us from doubt and despair. Preserve us from worldly wisdom and false teaching. Forgive the sins of your people. Strengthen the doubting and faithless. Bring back the forgetful and wayward, and comfort the anxious and the distressed. Lord, we commend our sister, Linda Kyle, into your care as she undergoes surgery this coming week. We pray that you would grant success to the surgery and bring about a full and speedy recovery. And we also pray for the family of Jody Schomer, whose sister was called home to heaven and taken to yourself by death. Be with them and comfort them in their sorrow with your sure promises of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Grant peace and rest to us all, as we pray this in the name of Christ our Lord, and join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.